What is up guys? Rather than do a book review today, I'm actually going to jump in and talk a little bit about one specific individual. Uh, he has not written a book himself in particular, but I think he's been on some really lengthy podcasts. You know, Farnham Street, if you guys have heard of that, farnhamstreetblog.com, Tim Ferriss podcast a couple times. There's about five or six hours of recorded audio of Naval just talking about you know, his beliefs, the mental models he uses, his primary investment strategies, book recommendations, just a ton of super useful information. And I thought that putting it all in one spot could be beneficial to other people as well. So if you listen along, the main thing I'm going to cover just that uh, his primary beliefs, his some of his ideas on decision making about the people he surrounds himself with, the investments he makes. Uh, and the habits that he's been able to create. And then lastly, the book recommendations that he's made because you know, this guy is known for being an absolutely voracious reader, as they say. He consumes hundreds and hundreds of books uh, for many years. Like I, I think he's, he's only 43, but he's been doing that type of reading for about 20 years or so, so maybe even more. So, I mean, he's, he's definitely consumed thousands of books, and anybody that's at this level of success and thinking, I think you can take their book recommendations uh, extremely seriously, if nothing, to kind of explore the, the authors that he's recommending. So, uh, who is Naval? If you guys don't know, Naval Ravikant is founder CEO of a company called AngelList. Super awesome company. Uh, they, well, if you're in the startup world, <laughs> if you're looking at investing in technology companies, you've obviously heard of AngelList or Angel.co. You can actually go to Angel.co slash Naval and see his portfolio of over 200 investments, including the likes of Uber, Twitter, Insta, uh, who else is it? Thumbtack, Postmates, you know, uh, he invested in Yammer, which was pretty sure sold to Salesforce, like some big, big wins. Um, so the guy has been extremely successful over his career. Um, Angelus is cool too, though, because it's sneakingly useful. Um, I live in the startup technology world, and um, all the places that you can go to kind of search for opportunities or um, hire people, I think what spawn what they spawn with their jobs board and being able to connect um, technology-based people, developers, people in that world with companies. Um, has been amazing. I, I don't know that that's really replicated anywhere else in the internet. So not only do they provide people the ability to invest in startups, just your average layman who is an incredible investor, but you can also, you know, if you are in the startup world or looking to get into it, highly recommend you go to angel.co slash jobs and there's hundreds of people um, or postings and you can see everything from remote postings to the you know growth scores of companies that you want to maybe uh, check out and be involved with so uh, done some super awesome things but I think the reason why I'm highlighting all this information and, and collecting into one spot is because of his deep thinking and his um, kind of dedication to uh, just knowledge and, and living a, a fulfilled life so um, a lot to be learned from the info that pulled from those podcasts and of course highly recommend checking them out if you have the time but I'm just going to cover a couple of the, the ideas that I thought were extremely unique and, and exciting um, about you know, those conversations. So first off, everybody is familiar with the idea of Buddhism, uh, maybe not in detail, but he claims to subscribe to the religion of rational Buddhism. So I really like this idea and this just thought process from him because what he's saying is, you know, I agree with a lot of the things that go on in Buddhism, but you know what, I prefer to think for myself. So I'm not just going to blindly subscribe to everything that they put out and just say that that is kind of where where my beliefs lie. Instead, I want to reconcile all those ideas with what I've learned in science and evolution. So his one of his most unique ideas is this, this comment that, you know, science is actually the study of truth. And the reason science is the study of truth is because you can make falsifiable predictions in science. So think about that again. So in science, when you're testing, um, you can actually make these false file predictions and understand which is true, which is not true. So his exact quote is, you know, it is the only true discipline because it makes false file predictions. It actually changes the world. Applied science is how we get technology. 
and technology is what separates us from other animals. So science to him is, is the study of truth, and mathematics is the language of science and nature. So I think that's really, really interesting. Um, you know, it obviously entices me to, to follow down the path of a lot of the evolutionary books and, and the science-related books that he's, he's recommending, which I'll get into uh, in a bit because those, you know, by his, his set of standards, um, will lay out the groundwork, the path to a lot of the truth um, in, how, in how we evolve and going forward. This is something that he doesn't recommend, but Ray Dalio principles, he mentions that too, that you can find a lot of truths in nature and, and those will hold, hold true into how um, we interact with you know, other humans. So one other primary belief that kind of follows in line with that is because science is true, he almost completely disagrees or doesn't hold any weight or hold any water in the, the argument around you know, macroeconomics and wasting any time debating macroeconomics. And what he means there is just that it's almost impossible to find uh, an economist that's backing up, they, that won't hold like one side or the other of uh, a certain uh, story or party line, I guess, uh, when it comes to the economic the economy and what's happening. So I guess the best analogy there is, you know, you wouldn't actually be able to tell what's going to happen if a different president got elected because we can't test that. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. It's impossible to play out that scenario with 100% accuracy. So that's why he doesn't really necessarily believe in macroeconomics. Uh, but I thought it was worth pointing out that, of course, you know, as a logical person would, he definitely still believes in like supply and demand and microeconomics, which is imperative to business. Um, so those are kind of some of his primary beliefs that I thought were super interesting. Um, the second kind of list here that I put together is on his decision making and some of the mental models that he's following to make the best decisions over and over again. And, you know, Naval is actually touted for being one of the most rational thinkers, um, which, you know, is, is credit to these mental models to be able to separate emotion from uh, your decisions, I think is a, is a common thread that I've ever seen come up and up over and over again. Um, you know, with the most successful people that, that um, I've followed or been, been reading about. So mental models is, um, again, one of those things that is a commonality. It's a common thread. You know, people like Charlie Munger with Poor Charlie's Almanac has over 100 mental models that he looks through and, and tries to put his decisions through to make sure that they're ironclad before he's he's making making any decision in particular. Because um, another common thread is a lot of these guys, they would just prefer not to be wrong. They don't want to be wrong. You know, they don't make rash decisions. That's the difference is um, we are trained by nature to be able to make emotional decisions and then justify them with logic. Instead, you know, if you're able to reverse those and, and use what we know to be true and make rational decisions, it's going to be a lot more beneficial. You're going to be, have a lot more accuracy in your decisions in the long term. So in if you're checking out this uh, Trello board that I put together, there's a list of mental models and most popular ones in a couple different articles. Farnham Street has a whole section on it that I'd recommend reading. Um, and the overview image here is of game theory because he totes that as, as one thing that he's been studying for a long time and has been extremely useful in his decision making. Uh, one other obvious thing, because he is an investor, that I found extremely interesting is how he makes decisions on people and companies, and they're essentially one and the same. You know, he looks uh, common, again, a common thread, I'll say it a lot, but it's true if you find these commonalities in people over and over again. I mean, they have to be true, right? So, um, or you have to give some weight to them at least. So a lot of people will say they invest in people, not necessarily the company or the opportunity. Um, that holds true for what he says, but there's a specific order of things that he looks for in people. Um, and for any generic person that's kind of part of his inner circle, uh, typically it's just, you know, being intelligent, having high energy and then high integrity. The one difference is that when he's looking for founders or people to invest in, the idea that they are long-term thinkers is a hard stop for him. If they're not long-term thinkers, if they want to optimize for you know six months, you know a year, two years, three years, 
that is definitely not an opportunity that he wants to pursue. And one insightful comment that he made in line with that is that all of the rewards, all of the you know meaningful rewards in life are are um, achieved through compound interest. And compound interest doesn't necessarily only mean with money. It's with relationships. It's with intelligence. It's with friendships. You know, so all of the the fruits that are worth kind of going after and, and discovering in life, he says, are through that compound interest. So having a short-term mindset is just not even something that he will uh, consider immediately kind of writes off with people. Um, and then, yeah, the other, the other three are pretty pretty standard. Obviously, somebody who has not only intelligence, but insights, knowledge, deep level understanding in their area of expertise or where they're starting a company, high energy, passion, and then high integrity is, is the other big one that he kind of spends a lot of time looking into because that's uh, kind of a key differentiator. It's not super common, um, but people who do have high integrity, uh, those are just the people that he wants to associate with. And the investments, the other interesting thing that he mentions in terms of investments that I think, you know, if, if you yourself are an investor or you're looking at opportunities to, you know, be in business, whatever it may be, um, he notices that all of the great companies he invested in or just in general, almost always defy conventional wisdom. So the story that he uses here is is Bessemer. Um, Bessemer is a, you know, I think a top five venture capitalist firm in, in the Valley, Silicon Valley, and they keep track of their anti-portfolio. So he doesn't recommend doing this necessarily, but what it allows them to do is see the wins that they missed out on and because they hold this extremely transparent and open-minded um, nature and uh, uh, philosophy within their company, it allowed them to invest in Webvan, which was essentially food delivery in, I think, 99, before it was actually popular, and then get that blow up, have all the egg on their face, and then still have the courage to invest in Instacart, which ended up being uh, a unicorn win for them. So I think that was a credible kind of idea, just not only the fact that they have that anti-portfolio, but if, if you see something that makes sense right away, that, that's probably and is already conventional wisdom, it's likely not going to be kind of game-changing in, in the type of company it is. Uh, I have a couple other notes here just in, in general related to you know how he thinks about making bets on companies. Um, short story there is, is that he would ideally like to look at 10,000, make bets on 100, and double down on 5, rather than just see maybe 100 and, and go all in on 10. So uh, last thing is on habits. He mentioned a couple of pretty interesting things. This could be applied to your life if you're trying to break any habits. Um, one of the main things is he says he gives himself a reason for following through on a habit. So one of the biggest life-changing habits that he's kind of um, implemented in his life is working out every morning. So a quick 20, 30 minute workout with his trainer um, every morning has really changed his life and not only for health reasons, but also because it's allowed him to use that as a crutch to follow through on other habits. So because he actually committed to this morning workout, he was able to drop um, drinking alcohol, sometimes drinking caffeine, you know, eating healthy because he was solely focused on dedicating himself to this morning workout. And if he was doing those other things, it was just harder to follow through on. Um, so yeah, I think that could be a good lesson if you're trying to break some habits. Now on to book recommendations. So we went through primary beliefs, some of his decision-making on people and investments. Uh, and then the really cool thing is all these book recommendations he makes. I mean, he just sits there and lists off books. I didn't include all of them, but some of the... I th- some of the best ones I think fall into a couple different categories. One is science, because obviously one of his primary beliefs is science is the study of truth. So, which is why he is such a huge admirer of Richard Feynman. If you don't know who Richard Feynman is? He is a Nobel Peace Prize or Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist who is actually insanely charismatic. So he's he's a funny guy. I didn't realize this about him, but I started watching some YouTube videos and some documentaries, and and you know not only is is he brilliant, like this is one of the guys that had an 
you know, a major impact on coming up with the atomic bomb and developing the atomic bomb, but he is um, just exceptional at capturing interest, explaining very complex things in very simple ways. Um, so I'm excited. To, I've never read this Shirley or Jokey, Mr. Feynman, but that's one of the primary books that he recommends. And I'm definitely going to pick that one up. Can't wait for it. The other one is like spirituality and religion. So a lot of the Sam Harris books um, he recommends. And then one thing to note is that if you're trying to study a specific problem, an insightful idea he gave is that, you know, the problem likely didn't come up this year or this like in the past five years. Humans have been around for a long time. So if it's an old problem, it's best to look for the solutions that have stood the test of time. No sense in looking at the bestseller list because those are probably simple ideas, especially in kind of self-help and business. He said they're usually simple ideas wrapped up in a lot of pages. So he definitely doesn't go through the entire books. He'll skim, he'll skip around, try to pull main ideas out of these books. But um, in terms of business, he puts in Poor Charlie's Almanac, which is just a testament to the mental models that he pulled out of there. Um, and then, of course, there's a bunch of books in relation to evolution because you know, directly related to science there. Uh, this is a prime example. He says, you know, if you're studying evolution and you haven't read any Darwin, what are you doing? You know, figure it out. The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin is a, apparently a must read. I haven't read it, but i um, definitely excited to pick up a few of these. Uh, he also mentions some sci-fi in here. Uh, where's the one that I saw, which is Snow Crash. I think it is. Yeah, Snow Crash. Really excited. I just started reading this one. The Snow Crash is um, apparently this guy, Neil Stevenson, predicted a lot of the things that would happen in the technology world and how we develop. So excited to hear uh, and read more about those Snow Crash. But yeah, I highly recommend. I'll include the link to all these book recommendations. Um, you know, if nothing else, I like the fact that Amazon kind of leads you down a rabbit hole once you find one that you like. Uh, Sapiens, for the record, is the most recommended and gifted book by Nabal. Last thing I'll mention here is just a couple of the quotes that I pulled out. Um, guy is just brilliant. So, I mean, the quotes that he mentions are so awesome. The one that stuck out the most to me is, easy choices, hard life. Hard choices, easy life. This was by Jersey Gregorick, his, actually, his trainer that he trains with every morning. So, that, I mean, is just such an awesome way to put it right easy choices hard life hard choices easy life it means if you do the hard stuff um everything else will kind of fall into place more or less uh pray specifically and criticize generally almost a management uh, kind of quote there from warren buffett richard Feynman has a interesting quote that he mentions the first principle is you should never fool yourself or anyone and you're the easiest person to fool lastly because um, he mentions that there's kind of two phases to life, and one is exploration, the other one is exploitation. And because Naval uh, says that he's in the exploitation phase, you know, he's kind of explored building companies, he's explored building huge networks, he's explored investing extensively, had a lot of success in all three areas. Now he's more in the exploitation phase, which is, um, I think, just anecdotally becoming, not becoming, but just focusing more on happiness and peace and and uh, you know his mindset and all those things so he mentioned desire is a contract you make your with yourself to be unhappy until you get what you want so an interesting thread that he kind of brings up this relates to a lot of the buddhist ideas that he follows is that you know to be happy isn't necessarily to get what you desire or to have desire at all because with any of those emotions there comes a negative opposite to that emotion so if you're desiring if you're unhappy then of course that's natural people don't want to be unhappy they want to be happy but to be happy then they're living outside of the present moment because they're desiring something that they don't have so he focuses a lot on on just being present and i think that quote speaks to it i'll read it again desire is a contract you make with yourself to be unhappy until you get what you want so maybe it isn't all that healthy to desire too much he says that he only has usually one big desire in his life at any any point that doesn't mean he doesn't have goals but in terms of desire that's that's where he's at last column here is just a link to a lot of the different podcasts his investment portfolio at angela co his twitter account um but yeah 
I hope some of these ideas you know, got you thinking. Maybe you can pick up some of the books from his reading list. Again, I'll put the link in the description, but highly encourage you to follow uh, Noval Ravikant. Anyway, thanks so much for listening, guys. Talk.